for the UK government's Department for International Trade, where I bring technology companies to the UK, and also as chairman of the City Hindu Network. All the views expressed in here are personal. It's based on research. It's based on working with outstanding entrepreneurs as well. Okay, so just to give you a bit of background uh, before I kick off, as it were, it's my role as a government deal maker. You might find uh, uh, it, it in visual terms to be a little bit more interesting than what I was going to, to describe. And sadly, it is not uh, signing treaties with people around the world. I look for outstanding technologies and entrepreneurs, entrepreneurs who are leading the way in their field. So what are the lessons that I've learned about those who succeed and also lessons for leadership, whether you're in business or otherwise? I've seen companies go from zero to unicorn status. What were the winners doing right? What were the losers not doing so well? And as you can imagine, I'm still learning as well. So I wanna share some of those leadership traits, the lesson known ones. I'm also gonna share some research with you out of Harvard Business School and other academic institutions on uh, what allows leaders to get their messages across and get their companies to do well or be successful in their careers. And it's not the usual sort of internet infograms, I'm afraid. Uh, it is uh, more practical than that, and it's more useful and penetrative than that, what I'm going to share with you. Like I said, my government role is what I'm going to draw on on this, but the views are personal. I'm also going to draw on my role as chairman of City Hindu Network. Uh, in case you don't know uh, what uh, Hindus are, and I'm sure many of you do, well, if the world was just 100 people you might be able to see on there how many of those uh, would be Hindu. There's about out of 7 billion on the planet, there's over a billion of us. There's certain traits uh, and terms that you'll have come across. Uh, I'm not going to draw upon these so much in my, uh, uh, in my talk, but you will know, and I'm sure you've heard of things like Dharma and Karma, even Maya uh, as well, okay? Uh, and most of us tend to come from India, and many of us live in the UK and the United States. But let's go back to the issue of leadership. What does it actually uh, look like? Okay, what does it look like for those of us who are in business, trying to level up the global economy, trying to solve some of the world's biggest problems, trying to resolve some of the inequalities that you can see in that map? If the world was arranged by country size according to GDP, that's what the world would look like. You can see there is uh, a lot of skinny areas. And for those, whatever area of leadership you're in, whether you're in politics or entrepreneurship, what are the things that I found through not just the academic research, but also practically talking to winners in business, winners in politics who've managed to do it? Because there's a lot of you out there watching this who will be very good at what you do, but the message isn't coming across. And so you're not able to get the leverage to success that you deserve. So what are the lessons we can learn from some of those who we often think total empty vessels, but doing incredibly well? How the hell did that happen? How come their messaging was so good, despite their product or offering in politics or business being so poor? And I want to cover some of that with you now, okay, in this, okay? Um, I'm going to ask you this question. What do these statements have in common? Okay. Uh, in 1981, the British government met to discuss the best business person to front a campaign about what citizens would do in the event of uh, a nuclear attack. On the names put forward was England football team captain Kevin Keegan. You might think that odd. It won't be in a second. What does this statement also have in common with that. Research suggests executives with squarer, more angular faces are far better, fare better rather, in salary negotiations, are far better in salary negotiations compared to rounder faced, it's probably me, equally competent colleagues. And it's true whether you're a man or a woman. Yeah, I've got a CrossFit session in about three hours as well to get a more angular face. What do those two statements have in common with this third one? A recent study found that the most watched TED Talks on topics such as leadership are made by presenters who use twice as many hand gestures as those who present on similar topics uh, in less animated fashion. Same topic, same content. One was getting listened to and getting ahead than another.
And we sometimes say, oh, well, that's just a, it's the TikTok generation. They don't, yeah, they're all style over substance. It's getting results. What can we do about this? What are the lessons out of research and practical lessons that I've uh, learned from my observations of dealing with entrepreneurs as a deal maker for the government uh, as well? What are we seeing, which are some of the traits of success? Well, you'll have uh, come across the term hard and soft messengers. Hard messengers possess status. Okay, research shows four important traits that contribute to status-driven messenger success, socioeconomic position, competence, dominance, attractiveness. All of these factors will suggest, will suggest status, and status is a hard messenger, and hard messengers tend to succeed. This is not me saying you go out and rent a Lamborghini, stand in front of it, and suddenly you'll be able to sell your product. Obviously, people are a bit more attuned to reality and, and authenticity than that. But we're going to build upon what this means in terms of your messaging, whether you're in a career, an entrepreneur, uh, or uh, in business, or a politician. People are also less likely, their behavior changes, less likely to honk at higher status cars. In other words, hard messengers get certain privileges in life. And we know this, and it annoys us. Uh, uh, and like I said, those hard messenger uh, traits, we need to bring out more. How do we do it? What do we do? So that's what I'm going to build upon in this. The reason you've got Pierce Brosnan there is that he conveys some of those hard status. You know, we hear about in, uh, Instagram and influencers. They're looking for some of these hard messengers in an authentic, correct way. So where do we find them and how do we bring that out in our own messaging so that all the hard work we're doing is not lost uh, because our messaging is poor. Hard messengers, like I said, status. Okay, they bring those traits and that's one example of it. Even people like me with slightly rounder faces get to be brand ambassadors around the world as well. The messaging has become important, not just, as so many of you listening to this, the expertise. The old focus on expertise is just the building block. Research from Joseph Marx, who's a PhD, on what factors get people listened to. Well, charismatic messengers beat considered ones. And that frustrates us, particularly in politics. But it'd be far better to be both considered and charismatic. An attractive one trumps an accurate one. I said trump there, didn't I? Uh, an attractive one trumps an accurate one. Okay, well, I'm not saying you go and have facial reconstruction surgery, uh, but certainly grooming m becomes part of that message. You know, this whole idea that oh, I'll just walk around in, in shorts at a talk and I'll look cool. Well, I'm afraid attraction will matter. Dominant voices beat dependent ones. Tone, intonation. Again, you might want to consider even elocution. But these factors are important. Too often I've met entrepreneurs with great technology or business people with great technologies. But... Their, the way they came across, the way they looked, and we all know this research, you, know, you make up your mind in a few seconds, sadly, they didn't get a far, not, not with me, they were fine with me, because I knew about this, with others, okay? What else does the research show, some of which you'll be familiar with? Well, well again, when it comes to hard and soft messengers, hard messengers are perceived to possess superior status. As I've said, soft messengers are listened to because audiences feel connectedness with them. So it's not to say we should all become hard messengers. Uh, the, the German chancellor would be in the category of, obviously, a soft messenger. The Canadian prime minister, the New Zealand prime minister would be in the category of a soft messenger. There is a role for them. There is an argument, and some research supports this, that leaders in countries where they have elections tend to go from the hard messenger to soft, soft to hard, and so on. They tend to alternate in their elections uh, between those because people get fed up or whatever else it might be. But there is a role for soft messengers. Many of you will be more able to convey that empathy, that connectedness. It is not to say to suppress it. What this is to say is to know these traits are important, work out which ones are yours, and make sure you are attuned and part of your messaging is to use those, to utilize those, to succeed in politics or entrepreneurship, whatever else that field might be. When people were asked to rank which CEOs they did not know were the most successful, just purely they were given photos, they're only given photos of CEOs. Now, many of you watching this are CEOs. You aspire to be CEOs. You aspire to move up in your careers. Think about this. The respondents 
were accurate. They were just given photos. They weren't told who was successful. They were just told, which of these do you think is? And they were accurate as to who was. Just by looking at them, that doesn't seem to make sense. They based their answers on which faces they said were the most competent looking. Well, that's worrying. For those of you who are incredibly competent thinking, I'm ruled by a boss who's an idiot, the reason it's worrying is because you're thinking, my God, they got there because based on just how they looked, yeah, I'm afraid so. Wouldn't it be better if you who've got the skills and the abilities were able to combine both and therefore be more of a genuine article? The same thing happened when asked who would win elections. People asked, who do you think is going to win elections? They weren't told what the electoral outcomes were. So when it went national, um, the more popular, famous election, we're about, you know, the local level. And it was the ones that looked successful. Can you believe it? So what's the definition of look successful? I'm sure most of you have got an idea of what successful looks like in an image. Okay, looking competent may give a halo effect. Looking competent. How many times have you walked into a room and just assumed that the person who looked the most competent was actually the one who was in charge and found that actually, surprisingly, sometimes they were not? That halo effect is something which is a factor in achieving success. Of course, that alone won't do it. You can't just have brand and no substance. But sadly, I see too many people with lots of substance, not enough of the halo effect, the little icing on the cake, which would help them succeed so much further. And it's been one of the sort of sad frustrations, the big injustices that I see that people who are really good don't get to where they should be getting to because of the 10% or the 20% of factors which make a big difference and the academic research proves it. Instead, what do you get? You get empty hats getting further ahead instead who've mastered the messaging. And we need to level that up. We need to make sure the experts, people like you listening to this, get to where you deserve to be based on some of these. So who leads? Well, there's the dominant types, like I said, the hard who thrive on conflict, competition and uncertainty. It isn't me. There's the vulnerable messengers. They also get to lead at the right point, the authentic, the ones who display humanity. Like I said, the, the New Zealand uh, prime minister has been picked out as a particular strong example of this at this moment. There's the trustworthiness, the soft angle. Now, some of you will innately have these strengths, play to them. The competence and integrity part, the good moral standards. People think, oh, I've got to suppress some of these things because I see idiots getting ahead of me. No, bring these out. They are the traits of success. The charismatic, the ones who've got that surgency, that, that, that surge in the energy, uh, uh, the enthusiasm, the positivism in their area. Again, you've got people on you know, the internet and you think, my God, it's so charismatic, but all they're doing is requoting the Buddha in, in a more modern context and suddenly they've got great followers, all the rest of it, and their businesses are doing well. They're building business purely out of charisma alone. Well, if you've got some of those traits, you want to use them. If you don't, then it's time to develop them. If you want to succeed, I'm assuming you already have a great product, a great offering, a great voice, things that you've got something to offer to the world. So where does that take us? Well, in the words of Lincoln, there is that whole attitude issue as well. We complain because roses, bushes have thorns, or rejoice because thorn bushes have roses. I was asked this morning at a government meeting, how are the entrepreneurs you're working with who are coming over to the UK from around the world, how are they feeling about COVID? How are they feeling about everything else going on in the world? And I said, you know what? I've not seen this level of enthusiasm amongst technology entrepreneurs since, well, 2000, since the, uh, the whole initial internet boom that happened. And I don't think they're being unrealistic. I think they just have that sense of, Rejoicing, or in the words of Patton, there are three ways men get what they want. Uh, and you know, in the world, there is that gender bias. Planning by working and by praying, it's the point being there. Look, you're going to have to take positive action on some of the traits that the research shows helps you win. Praying alone that somebody hears your voice and, and the offering and the product you have, they'll suddenly find you ain't going to work. I'm afraid it is that element of shouting out more. Again, put in the words of uh, Eisenhower, it's the art of getting someone else to do something you want uh, uh, because you want to get them to do it, right? The art of getting someone else to do something you want done, you want done because he wants to do it, getting them enthused. And it is those elements of charisma, those soft and hard messaging, which is so often neglected for the substance. Substance is important, but it's going to get you nowhere. It's not going to get you ahead unless we've got 
these things. Finally, there is that hard messaging. There is that element of hard messaging. You can't get them to do it any other way. Uh, they make them feel the heat. So there is an element for that as well. Uh, I'm going to come back to John Quincy Adams in a second. So what does research from Harvard Business School show? Uh, there's a chap called Atanokis. Uh, he's Greek, as you can guess from the names. He, he researched the leadership qualities and did academic research on it. So it wasn't the modern day infograms and sort of the, the sort of the superficial analysis that we so often see in the little quote on Twitter. We're talking proper academic research. You can look it up. It's uh, Harvard Business Review published it, Harvard Business School did it. And there's many, been many others who've done when I was at, uh, at university and we were reading politics that was the difference between the different types of leadership. There's been a lot of academic research done on it. What he found critical well, the people who were perceived, and remember, a perception was important because just having a great offering wasn't enough. The messenger, the messenger and the perception was critically important. The ones who we took time to use metaphors and analogies tended to get ahead. Those who used stories and anecdotes, contrasts tended to get ahead. It's often said that Barack Obama became president when he gave his speech at the Democratic National Convention uh, in, what was it, 2004 or 2008, something like that, 2008, I think it was. That's when he became president because of the anecdotes, the metaphors. You won't get a political speech nowadays, a major one, without them saying, Julie from the council flat in, oh, they're overdoing it, so you've got to be uh, aware of that. But these were perceived as being leaders in the nature in which they talked about, whether it's the tech entrepreneurs or the politician, the three-part list, the moral conviction of what they were doing, the belief that what they're doing is good beyond the product they're offering. I deal with a lot of entrepreneurs and what they're now telling me about and what I want them to do is tell me about how they're solving the world's biggest problems. I've got companies like City Spotter I've worked with who are, who are helping remove fake news using algorithms. For instance, Credit Enable helps people to get the loans they should in their businesses because they're helping banks find credit risk which is good and bad. So they're really helping banks become more efficient so money gets to where it should do. Otherwise, you could have just said, yeah, it was a fintech company. No, it wasn't a fintech company. City Spotter isn't an AI company. They are solving some of the world's biggest problems. They are showcasing their moral conviction, the bigger purpose of what they're doing, so they get better quality of stock. They get more people behind them, and the product deserves that. There's hippo cabs. Uh, uh, Sami, another technology company out of India brought to the UK, it's like Uber for ambulances. Oh, it's like Uber, is it car transportation? How boring. No, what it does is it makes sure that hospitals don't have to rely on ambulances to take people back after, say, dialysis, i.e. non-urgent uh, cases of returning people home, but they can use medically equipped cabs and train people to do it. Saves a fortune potentially for the NHS. Okay, so it was converting what you're doing into that bigger story and making that message come across in your daily work. Uh, all the speeches you are giving, all the webinars or whatever else, using the metaphors, analogies, uh, anecdotes, using all of these techniques. And Atanakis found through his research at Harvard Business School, this got people ahead. Can you believe it? It got people ahead. Okay. Uh, and though, so it is important. It is incredibly important. Talk about charisma. People think, oh, can that be learned? And don't forget, comes for, well, from the word charisma comes charm. It's a Greek word and comes also charm. If you don't know what charisma is, it's charm. It's that politeness. It's body gestures, facial expressions, that animated voice tone. How often will a PhD tell us something which might revolutionize the world, but we'd switch off because they don't have the messaging abilities. And I'm afraid the duty lies on them, not on the listener. The duty is on the speaker, on the messenger to get it right, especially if what they believe they're providing is that important. If you believe what you're doing in your technology company, entrepreneur, business, or in your career is that important, if you think you really are that good, then set that expectation of yourself that you are going to have and learn what are the traits of charisma, which does include confidence, I'm afraid. It does include a degree of self-belief and also uh, uh, those speaking abilities, the animated tone and the body gestures, I'm afraid. Things you might think are superficial. Of course, be aware of overconfidence, particularly speaking to the men out there. Cockiness won't get you very far. Uh, being full of it, as it were, won't get you very far 
either I'm still learning. So many of you might think, well, you're talking about this stuff, but I don't see you deploying it. Maybe we're all still uh, learning. I used to be a visiting fellow at uh, Corpus Christi College, Oxford, where I would uh, lecture and research behavioral finance. Let me tell you one of the most important things I found about the most successful people in the world uh, at what they do. And these were traders. These were massive hedge fund managers. They were, uh, they were very successful at what they did. And what it was is that they didn't have attribution bias. There were leaders in their field. We're talking about people like the global head of uh, trading at Salomon Brothers, Bill Lipschitz or hedge fund managers leading $2 billion companies, $10 billion uh, funds and the like. They didn't have attribution bias. What's attribution bias? That's when you attribute success to yourself. It's a bias which can lead to arrogance. Those didn't succeed. None of these people said, oh, I'm just amazing. And I don't mean they were just paying lip service to it. It wasn't really me, it was my team, but I'll take the award. Uh, they didn't have the God complex. So yes, you've heard, you know, you've got to be authentic. What does that mean? Well, there was this lack of attribution. There was space for luck. Jim Simons, probably the most successful fund manager in the history of the world, um, put it this way. He says, and they asked him, how come you're so successful? How come you're so good at what you do? And he said, well, luck had a lot to do with it. I don't think he was faking it. I think he was just being genuine. And for that, you got a lot, lot more credit to it. Anyway, the successful leaders, uh, they didn't fall foul of attribution bias okay put another way and i said i'm chairman of city hindu network and i'll revert back to the hindu side of uh things one who has control over his mind is tranquil in heat and cold in pleasure and pain and honor and dishonor and is ever steadfast with the supreme soul we know we need that in this time you know we talk about uh, uh mental illness well very often people turn to faith and religion uh whether it's christianity islam sikhism jainism whatever else uh, it, it might be. In effect, for me or for others, the leader is the one who has that tranquility. We look, when we look at the, 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 the speeches that our political leaders give, we're looking to see, are they calm? Or parents in crisis, are they calm? Well, it's the same thing to get ahead. The traits which the leaders exhibited time and again was that tranquility, that ability to say, even if it felt like they were going into battle, the ability to say this too shall pass, to provide perspective and calm. That was a critical factor, of course. We know it is. Practicing that, getting that across in the business environment, particularly during COVID, particularly during everything going on in the world at the moment, uh, might seem like a big ask, but actually it's important to remember that's what gets us ahead for selfish reasons, if nothing else. Leadership is getting people also to believe in their own powers. Partly what I've already said, but that's what the research again showed, that ability to empower others uh, put another way, leadership was giving people purpose and autonomy. There's a fantastic book called Drive, and where they research what some of the most successful technology companies had in common. How did Google invent Gmail? Why was it them? It wasn't just that they had loads of money. How come everybody came obsessed with, yes, these, these blasted things, the uh, iPhones, when it's just a bunch of glass, metal, okay and plastic and yet we're so obsessed with it and it's not simply because oh it helps us communicate and stay in touch with people how come steve jobs could get people to work 24 hours a day 36 hours a day law firms would love to know the secret to this some of them do know it and it's not just simply because they were paid more in actual fact payment tended to remove remove uh, uh people's competence level so the more you paid them the less competent uh, they were doing the work. And this was an experiment which was done on monkeys, children, and adults. They were given simple tasks. And when those tasks, tasks which were enjoyable, so in the case of a monkey, it was a task where they pressed the button, they got a banana. Uh, a kid, it was playing with cars, but through building blocks. And with adults, it was the joy of building an aircraft, a uh, little toy aircraft. Anyway, things that they knew they enjoyed. As soon as they started giving them payment and saying, right, you're going to get rewarded, their abilities to get that same job done dropped. It wasn't out of boredom. It wasn't because they'd done the same task before. They allowed for all of that. When they were given a bigger purpose, you're not just making a phone, you're actually making people's lives better. But they were given autonomy and it was an activity which required skill. Those people excel. That's what the research uh, found. Again, the leaders were the ones who were able to do those things. Now you can't do that with everybody. Uh, in your staff and in your team, but those who were given the bigger purpose, and how often do leaders spend their time talking about the bigger purpose of what they're doing? They were given some autonomy and it was a skilled task. They got ahead. Of course, I mean, I've poo-pooed infograms and all the rest of it. I'm sure many of you have seen these, but it's a good reminder and a good summary 
of some of the things that I've said. Yes, there are good ones out there as well. What's the difference between the manager and the leader? And I'm sure, you know, you look at these, as I do, remember them for five minutes and then keep forgetting and going into sort of bad habits time and time again. But it is the ones who were consistently able to do that who got ahead. Again, the manager on the left, the leader on the right of the screen. The manager on the left, the leader on the right of the screen. Manager on the left follows the map, the leader carving those new roads. Okay, the manager assigns the duties, the leader fostering the ideas. I had a great government talk this morning with the head of the Global Entrepreneur Program. And he ticked all the boxes on the right-hand side. He said, look, guys, what are the new innovative ideas? What are the new great ways? How do we keep doing uh, and excelling and bringing these global entrepreneurs from around the world to the United Kingdom? It was about fostering. It wasn't just simply, you do this, you're going to do that, you're going to do this. Here's some rules, follow them. It was how do we motivate people to know how fantastic it is to set up a global technology company here in the UK with the skills basis? How do we make sure they got the resources um, that they can carve that new path for themselves, uh, find the funding sources, find the networks, find the skills skills bases uh, and the people that they need. Again, manager on the left relies on control. The one on the right is inspiring trust. And you know what the great thing is? Once you start becoming more of that leader, life becomes a hell of a lot easier, both in your work and elsewhere. As a result, and the results come thick and fast as well. Uh, so there is one other element I've mentioned. Yes, there is that truth to power in my own industry, the fund management, the asset management industry. Uh, it's not the easiest thing to say, yeah, bankers are overpaid. It's one thing for the public to say, but when you're actually in finance and saying, no, they're overpaid, fund managers, uh, the ones that I've met, consistently incompetent at what they do uh, and not up to the job, and they're disserving the clients that they service. It, and when you say it on air, well, yeah, you're not going to be necessarily very popular, I'm afraid, as a result. But it is something, if you've got the conviction, you have to lead with your voice as well, and it will require you to do that. I will leave you not so much with this quote. If you can't find the bigger purpose, then here's one for you, but do find that bigger purpose in your leadership. It will help and sustain you through it. People talk about passion. Well, actually, purpose, I think, will help even more. That's one of my favorite quotes in terms of uh, purpose, but, but a bit more um, secular. Let's put it that way. If your actions inspire others to dream more, learn more, and do more, uh, and become more, you're a leader. I think Adams was definitely a, a, a leader for me. Um, so I hope you found this useful. Like I say, it's the talk that I give each year. Uh, it's a shortened version of a talk I give each year at Oxford University to business leaders. So it's a lot shorter. I've removed a lot of the, because I know the audience isn't just purely Hindu. I've removed a lot of the um, Hindu elements to it, but the longer one um, in my capacity as chairman of uh, City Hindu Network, I hope to be able to uh, deliver there where I join the elements from faith and how they help in profession and leadership and getting ahead and success. But I said in a more broader secular audience, I hope it's also uh, been insightful, particularly some of the research which has been done on leadership. Hope you found that useful. Thank you very much, all of you, for uh, being on here and continue just posting the questions. I'll answer them afterwards uh, in the chat boxes and the comments. Uh, depending on which platform you're watching this on, feel free to subscribe, like, you know, all those uh, various things. Okay. And at the bottom, there's a couple of websites. Have a look at the EinsteinChallenge.com. It's the technology companies I've been working with who are solving some of the world's biggest problems and how we in the Global Entrepreneur Program, like I said, part of the Department for International Trade, uh, has been show have been showcasing some of those companies and what those entrepreneurs are doing and what they're doing so right as leaders in their own right and getting that product out there to solve some of these critical crisis uh, uh, technology solutions that they have. Okay, everyone.